That's a good question. The East-West uh, within the European Union, obviously it became um, a rather heated debate when already the uh, candidacy of Romania, Bulgaria, um, Poland, and to an extent um, Hungary and the Czech Republic were being debated. Um, that enlargement uh, took place a few years ago and up to and including the uh, enlargement uh, process there was considerable discussion about this increasing rift between um, uh, East and West uh, Europe and then when the Polish workers when the enlargement took place and the Polish workers rather in large numbers came to the United Kingdom there was a um, sort of a moral panic again sort of spurred on by especially the popular tabloid media about how uh, European workers are taking jobs away from British workers and so on and that really propped up anti-East um, sentiments and then as I mentioned with the restricted rights for Bulgarian and um, Romanian citizens that even increased the uh, and heightened the um, rift between East and West. It subsided a bit now, um, and then there's a broad understanding that East-West uh, needs to be integrated. And you know the interesting thing that it has subsided now is precisely because North-South debate flared up. So this is the interesting moment we are going through because none of the Eastern European countries that are considered to be sort of the margins of Europe uh, experience the crisis in a way that uh, the South uh, experienced um, but also they are not members of the Eurozone so the fact that they are not members of the Eurozone that is the, uh, the, the currency zone um, just very quickly to refresh your mind, yet another complication in the saga of uh, European Union. The Eurozone has 18 countries, but European Union has 25, so they are not one and the same. And Eurozone doesn't include any of the Eastern European countries. So what happened in the last two years, we the problem has been uh, transformed into, as the earlier um, question implied into a north-south divide. So at the moment really the political heated debate is between north and south but the east-west is a simmering one. Simmering one that might come to also a head in the next couple of years because a couple of those eastern countries are considering for applying and becoming a member of Eurozone. And now there is of course con uh, debate whether Eurozone, Eurozone, uh, Euro, before it's solving its uh, crisis, should allow other Eurozone members to uh, enter into the um, zone and whether should, it should wait. Some people say actually joining of, especially for example if Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic join, uh, it would make the Eurozone even uh, stronger. Some people disagree with that. They say that they, they are inheriting um, necessarily weak currencies and it is going to require considerable structural adjustment to actually incorporate them into the Eurozone and that it cannot be allowed. So that's happening but it is not as intense as whether and to what extent the European Central Bank should bail out Spain, Italy and Greece. At the moment really that is the heated debate. So the division is really between north and south and east and west east and west is a simmering one. But I think we might see it picking up steam again if and when the eastern european countries some of them begin to actually prepare for candidacy for eurozone. Now this is very financial I just realized really based on political economy. Um, that I answered your question, but culturally it's also interesting to, to think about East-West issue. Um, there is a sense in which in Europe that 
its culture is dominated by core countries, although it doesn't call itself Western Europe, but those core countries include obviously Great Britain, uh, France and Germany, but also aided by um, particularly the Netherlands and, and, and Denmark and, and the Nordic countries. So these together constitute a block, as it were, that uh, there is a sense that there is, um, they are the guardians of Eastern European, uh, Eastern European, that was a slip, European culture and European society and, and economy. There is a sense in which that, um, for example, Spain, Italy, and um, uh, Greece, to a lesser extent, they're part of it, and even s much less in, in the East. There is, for example, uh, in political, economic, but cultural terms, there is a talk in Europe saying, to speed Europe, that we should understand that not all European countries can actually grow and develop and, and flourish, if not compete in the world economy in the same way. So we should bring, we should bring into being a legislation that recognizes this and institutionalize uh, two-speed Europe, if not three-speed Europe. A core Europe, a peripheral Europe, and a marginal Europe. Obviously, people like myself consider this quite dangerous because the very European ideal that undergirded the European Union itself is about creating a um, culture of sharing and culture of solidarity right across Europe. If you begin to develop a three-speed understanding of Europe, then you're beginning to also raise issues why should the third speed or uh, third speed European countries would want to become part of Europe at all? That raises that question. Coming back to your question again, though, the East, um, let's go even further East. I don't know if you will remember some of you, Turkey is still a candidate country. Um, there is a very interesting development over the last five years that took place. It took everyone by surprise. No one predicted that Turkish economy would have uh, grown as much as it did over the last five years. More like ten years, but over the last five years it's been most impressive. And no one predicted that, in fact, in the time of austerity, you, uh, Turkish economy would look very strong. When you compare with German, British and um, French economies, not to mention southern and eastern economies, Turkish economy right now, the best performing economy in Europe period, and people actually compare Turkey to um, Brazil, uh, India, China as the growing centers of the global economy. It is also much more robust than any of the uh, European economies. Robust in the sense that it is um, diversified. It's not one thing, but many things. It's strong in manufacturing, it's strong in tourism, it's strong in services, it's strong in digital economy, it's strong in uh, cultural production. It's the whole bit, it's a, as a package. Um, and this has generated an interesting um, debate in Europe. Um, in fact, until very recently, uh, there was a very common 19th century uh, term referring to Ottoman Empire and by extension to Turkey as sick men of Europe. I don't know if any one of you know that phrase. Sick men of Europe in the 19th century meant that Ottoman Empire was disintegrating, declining, and it was really a sore uh, space of European progress and, and growth. Very interesting, recently, um, I think it was The Economist or somebody else, uh, somewhere else, Foreign Affairs, there was a piece indicating that actually the situation reversed. Now they are sick men of Europe, many uh, European economies, that Turkey actually is not willing to consider participating. So the Turkish public opinion also has changed. And we are at a stage where even if Europe now went to Turkey and said we are going to accelerate your candidacy 
and we are going to include both Eurozone and European Union tomorrow, it's more than likely that Turkey would say, no, sort out your problems first, achieve a growth economy and, and a robust political economy, then we might consider it. And that's very um, different than five years ago in terms of, of the culture. Now, in Europe then, thinking about really the East has, um, or I should say is, on hold. That's a very interesting uh, development when we go uh, further east. So it's good to, um, the two last questions have been really good. It's also good to think about Europe in these regional categories as well. Core, peripheral, marginal, and outside, or north and south, or east and west. It's useful, useful to think in those terms as well.